Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Andrea Sellers, and I'm the Assistant Director for Regional Engagement with NC State's Alumni Association. We are so excited today to be providing the first in this part of our campus history series, partnering and brought to you by the NC State Libraries. We really know you're gonna have a great time and we hope that you'll all be able to join us for our upcoming um, events in the series. The next one will be next week, which will be a history of NC State basketball. And now without further ado, I wanna hand it on over. Thank so my you. name is, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Andrea. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Allison Hughes, and I'm part of the program planning and outreach team at NC State University Libraries. I'm so glad you, so glad you've joined us today or joined us for today's event. Um, before we start the presentation, I'd like to invite Nancy Quivala from Friends of the Library to provide our welcome. I'm Nancy Quivala. I'm a member and current president of the Friends of the Library Board of Directors at the North Carolina State University Libraries. And I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Friends to our first campus history tour of the spring. And in this series, we're going to be exploring history at NC State University through collections and exhibits created by the library staff and by university faculty. And if you're interested in, in continuing to engage with our cutting edge uh, library, I would encourage you to consider becoming a friend. Um, we're a philanthropic organization and we host a variety of programs throughout the year. And we also help to raise funds to support student success across campus and everything ranging from the collections and facilities to things like student scholarships. And next year will be our 75th anniversary. So we'll have a whole series of special programs and events then. So if you're interested in learning more about our philanthropic organization, please um, check your chat and there should be a link there that you can follow. Thank you all for joining and hope you enjoyed the program. I was muted, I apologize. Um, thank you, Nancy. During the presentation, we ask that you remain muted. If you have any questions, please place them in the chat and we'll collect them for a question and answer session after the presentation. We understand that today's topics are difficult and may be unsettling for attendees. Towards that end, we ask that you be mindful and respectful when asking questions. Because we are dealing with the KKK, some of the images may be disturbing to viewers. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Jason Miller, who is a professor of literature at NC State. His research interests include 20th century American poetry, American literature, literature theory, and pedagogy. He has published works focused on Martin Luther King Jr., Dorothy Cotton, and Langston Hughes. His newest work, Backlash Blues, Nina Simone and Langston Hughes will be released in the fall of this year. And without further ado, here's Dr. Miller. Thank you so much, Allison. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. There is no better partner to work with than the NC State University Libraries. This project got its beginnings in kind of a strange way. I was asked a number of years ago to document a little bit about Dr. King's visit. And like everyone else, I was shocked to learn that almost nothing had been known about that visit to our campus on July 31st, 1966. In exploring and tracking this work, it's brought me into an incredible amount of partnerships with great folks at the African American Cultural Center, the libraries, and the State Archives of North Carolina, where I was able to uncover 150 photographs of this day that had never even been developed. Those of you that will remember what negatives look like, I was peering over them through a magnifying glass, and you just could not ask for better partners at the state libraries. There are a lot of images and a lot of photographs. My favorite part of these presentations is always the discussion. So this project began as something that we wanted to do as an in-person museum exhibit, and we were able to do that nearly a year ago. But the wonderful folks at the library, when I spoke to them and I said, I'm worried that this history and this knowledge will disappear after this, 
came up with a wonderful idea to make it into a digital project available at the iPearl Immersion Theater at Hunt Library. And so this slide you're looking in front of you will be available for anyone in the future who wants to know more about this event and get it in a kind of a synopsis form. Dr. King visited our campus and one of the really unique things that happened is a commemorative button was made. You can see me wearing one of the revisited versions of the button that the libraries at the makerspace actually recreated for folks and can still be available. It's a large two and a half inch button that's available in a number of places and documents a history that's long been forgotten. Let's think just a little bit about 1966 in July. If you're a cultural enthusiast like me, you'll realize that Bob Dylan has just been in a motorcycle accident, which will keep him off the road and touring for eight years. You may not know that Langston Hughes, one of America's premier poets, is starring overseas in Senegal, where he is the star reader hounded and followed for autographs of this. He was a baseball player and his popularity exceeds anyone's there at that conference internationally. And you may even remember a comment by the Beatles, John Lennon, talking about just how popular they were at this time. But this is what microfilm and microfiche looks like. And this was part of the research I was able to uncover. But here's the thing. Dr. King wasn't even supposed to be here on July 31st. Originally, he was going to come July 10th. And the FBI files that I was able to look through documented that quite clearly. But what had happened is Dr. King had moved his entire family into the Chicago area to protest housing conditions. And so in the interim, he was invited to speak at another small place, Soldier Field in Chicago in front of 60,000 people. And so 60,000 people heard Dr. King speak on July 10th, the date he was actually um, originally going to be right here in Raleigh. That July 10th date looked like this. And again, if you can, please mute yourself out there. We're getting a little bit of an echo. But this is what July 10th looked like in Chicago. And here, of course, was Dr. King enthusiastically speaking to the crowd. And then in the lower right hand corner, traveling around by uh, motorcade and waving to the fans. Many people rarely actually hear Dr. King in action. So here's a clip in which Dr. King is rebuffing language by George Wallace, speaking in front of 10,000 people in Detroit's Cobo Hall on Je June 23rd, 1963. What I did is I just dropped the needle on one of the records I have and just kind of give you an, a random sample of Dr. King speaking. Here's what he sounded like. Now keep in mind when Dr. King delivered those words, he was standing on a milk crate because so many microphones had overwhelmed the podium that when he went out, 
no one, none of the photographers or film crew could actually see him. And so he teetered on a milk crate for 22 minutes delivering that speech. When Dr. King spoke at Reynolds Coliseum on July 31st, 1966, we know that he was greeted by four and a half minutes of applause before he even said a single word. We know that he spoke for 55 minutes and we know that he was interrupted quite similar to what you just heard no less than 33 times. The record of what he said has been lost to us. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in the end of our proceedings when I talk about the visual aids. Um, but what is fascinating to note is that this particular speech at Reynolds Coliseum was one that was attended by 5,000 visitors, an integrated crowd of sorts. But that is not what the day had for us because it had so much more. Because Dr. King was supposed to become July 10th, a gathering of the KKK from our state had come to the Capitol, literally the Capitol, and sat down. And the governor, Dan Moore, did not like this. And so when we knew Dr. King was actually going to come on J July 31st, the National Guard was brought in. 200 members of the National Guard were staged outside in Smithfield days before you heard me right, to guard the Capitol. This was not the only thing that set the stage for July 31st. Local residents in Raleigh had invited a woman named Mrs. Brown, and she claimed that King was nothing more than a part of a front for the communist cause. She claimed from Massachusetts to have FBI information and evidence, and she was against Dr. King's visit at this particular time. And most disturbing of all, the thing I get contacted about the most are these next images. It wasn't just the Klan. It wasn't just what National Guardsmen had to do. And it wasn't just like visiting speakers like Ms. Brown. What also shocked me in my research was that a number of churches in the Raleigh area took out advertisements in the News and Observer to preach against Dr. King the Sunday morning in which he was to appear. This ad alone seems innocuous. Is he a Christian, anti-Christian, Christ or anti-Christ? But the giveaway comes when you would have looked straight across the page across from this and seen this statement. July 30th, 1966, this ran in the Raleigh News and Observer with four churches naming that they agree with this type of language and statement. Words fail us. We know that language speaks most loudly often through silence. If we were to even point to a word like irony, we would note that Dr. King himself often quoted this phrase that's actually been used, talking about how people have been made from one blood all across the world. And he even quoted that on November 27th, 1962, when he spoke in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. So these ads also set the stage for Dr. King's appearance. And now the really startling statistics. David Cunningham's work on the KKK has found this. Please adjust your speakers. If you can't hear me, I'll be speaking in italics. In the mid 1960s, the total number of KKK members in the state of North Carolina outnumbered all of the rest of the states of America combined. There were more KKK members in North Carolina in the 1960s than in every other state in America combined. This sign, well known, greeted people outside of Smithfield. And the language that was used during this rally and continuously was that North Carolina, in the views of folks who agreed with this kind of life, was called Clansville, USA. So you're looking at a map that outlines the route of what happened. Dr. King spoke at Reynolds Coliseum at 430, approximately two and a half hours before Klansmen rallied from across the state, all the way from Charlotte and the mountains and all the way from the eastern part, and they parked their cars in the southern part of downtown. There's a ton of open area at that time and parking lots, and it was just a practical convenience. This left arrow in red 
is where they started. And they started moving up. And I'll come back to this map about three different times to show exactly where the rally went. I retraced this by foot by putting together evidence. And then we were able to show a lot of startling facts that came out of this. So after gathering outside municipal auditorium, they started moving northwards towards the Capitol. And this is the first thing that happened. They were greeted by police officer Robert Goodwin. A deal had been worked out. The Klan, led by its Grand Dragon leader on the right with his right hand extended, wanted to go to the Capitol again. Governor Dan Moore did not want them there and would not allow them to travel there. And so it was these policemen who said, why don't you guys stop short of the Capitol, do your rally in the area, but don't come all the way to the Capitol grounds. And so they would um, meet this agreement. You can read the images for yourself in terms of tension or lack of tension between these two groups. And it was decided that what would happen then is instead of rallying on the Capitol grounds per se, they decided to gather in Nash Square. Nash Square is still an open area. And I'm gonna move fairly quickly because I want the photographs to kind of speak for themselves. This is halfway up that red line, the afternoon of Sunday, July 31st. Here's what it looked like as documented by the eight photographers assigned to cover the KK, KKK rally and zero photographers sent out to cover Dr. King's speech at Reynolds Coliseum. These men in green would have had gold helmets on that said SG. They were called security guards, though they had nothing more than whistles and flashlights, helmets and black boots. And this is the other side of Nash Square. You can see this man in the middle claimed to be an NC State student. He said his name was John Furnham and he took photographs until he was kind of rooted out from the Klan gathering. Those boots he had were not on on accident. He had a 12 inch knife blade up them to protect themselves because he was worried. He turned over the knife to policemen and was escorted away from the gathering. You can imagine the kinds of confrontations that took place outside on the street, verbal accusations, derogatory language, And then the Klan did what they would have done almost at any other part of the state. They literally clasped hands in a circle, gathered together and had a rally right in the middle of Nash Square. In the center would have been three speakers. You'll notice these folks in hoods as we go through the photographs did not conceal their faces. It's a very unusual era in Klan history. The first person to speak was the Grand Dragon's wife. Her name was Sybil Jones. She spoke and gave a few words. The next person to speak at the rally is the man in the center, Grand Dragon Bob Jones or Robert Jones. He could not have a more fitting career. His background included time spent as a lightning rod salesperson. These black and white photos remind us of something that's easy to forget, his robe was a startling green color. Then the last speaker, after people represented this, was a chaplain. And that chaplain was named George Dorset from Greensboro. And his story would take us the whole rest of our presentation to get through. From 1959 to 1970, George Dorset was simultaneously a believer in Klan rhetoric and behavior, and an FBI informant. During those 12 years, he took the equivalent of over $200,000 in today's money to be an informant to the FBI, to steer the FBI and the Klan close to each other and away from each other. This was quite an embarrassment to the FBI when it came out. After the rally, we are now in the middle of this red, now the photographers move to the right side of the street and they don't document any of this part of the march. 
because they know the Klan's gonna come right back down Fayetteville Street. But the Klan does something quite intentional. 1,800 people strong in full regalia, surrounded by security guards, they come into direct line so that they walk right in front of the former Confederate monument to the dead. This is not an accident. And as they're doing that, a counter protest starts. A number of people opposed to the Klan put together signs. These number anywhere between 40 to 70 people. And their signs are also captured by photographers. There was no violent confrontation between this protest and the Klan rally during this time. Several other violent things happened afterwards uh, that the history books have shown us to be um, substantial, but not overwhelming. One thing that's quite startling is these marches, the Klan and the counter protest did not create a, a traffic jam. What happened is as much as an hour and a half before the Klan was set to rally, cars parked as if this were a drive-in movie theater. Most of these people had come, turned off their cars and simply wanted good seats. You can get a sense of just how large the, large the crowds were by looking at the sidewalks. Again, Fayetteville Street, downtown Raleigh on a Sunday afternoon. As the Klan now moves right towards the Capitol, not breaching that agreement of going on the grounds, but activating the visual rhetoric of the Confederate monument, they are about ready to turn towards Fayetteville Street. And just a few words here about what the Confederate monument used to be. Very few people realize that that monument was the oldest time capsule in the state of North Carolina. The bottom corner of it was dedicated in 1894 and it included literal items from Robert E. Lee. The monument was not unique. Over three dozen of these were sold throughout the South and they were standard boilerplate monuments. As we know, recently a number of protests took place and of course, most recently, the monument itself has been removed. After engaging that monument, a monument that uh, is no longer with us, now the Klan starts its march down Fayetteville Street, the full-on rally. Here are a few of the best of those most powerful and striking 150 um, photographs. Again, parked for an hour beforehand so they could watch the Klan go past. With the rally ended, Dr. King has been staying at a local resident's house and more than likely drove past on what is literally now Martin Luther King Boulevard, probably would have had a chance to look out the right side of his window on the way to Reynolds Coliseum up Western Boulevard and probably saw the remnants of the Klan rally breaking up, dispersing, falling apart. We don't know for sure, but I have tracked down the literal house where he stayed, know exactly the route he took to Reynolds Coliseum, and it is very possible that he saw some remnants of it from a car window. One thing of a dozen that stunned me was looking through these photographs, the involvement of children. I was absolutely startled at the way the next generation was 
indoctrinated and intimidated. These photos are nearly beyond words. Downtown Raleigh, peanuts and popcorn were sold, hot dogs. Children this age listened to Sybil, Bob Jones, and George Dorset. Babies were brought in strollers. To say nothing, of course, of the impact of all the other people that had to endure this happening in a public space. This is what the August 1st, 1966 cover of the News and Observer looked like the day after Dr. King's appearance and the Klan rally. The picture I showed you earlier taken by eight photographers appears in a bold headline, the Klan rally is covered. The photograph taken of Dr. King was actually taken by an AP photographer. Not even somebody associated with the News and Observer went to cover Dr. King's speech at Reynolds Coliseum. You can judge the impact on the size of the articles. I can assure you, having read them every word, that this Klan article goes on for another page and a half inside the newspaper this small headline about Martin Luther King continues on for about six more paragraphs. The Klan rally was largely successful in meeting its own goals in overshadowing Dr. King's appearance. The parallels between Bob Jones and Dr. King are startling. This iteration of the Klan started literally when Dr. King was delivering his I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington. Bob Jones was watching and said, we've got to do something to counter this. And so one of the things he did to counter this was he said, let's start a rally, hoping that 100 to 150 people would show up outside of the Charlotte area. Over 1,000 showed up. And in 1963, he knew it was time to revive things. And that iteration of the Klan started in direct opposition to the success and popularity of Dr. King. Now, what ends up happening to this version of the Klan is really staggering. What you are looking at is two weeks later at Memorial Auditorium, the south end of Raleigh, at the very top of the screen is the Capitol building. 5,000 people gathered for the largest political event of 1966 in North Carolina. Look carefully. These are the same security guard people, gold helmets, ties, flashlights. The rest of these people are here to support the Klan, but they've decided to not wear regalia. Bob Jones realized that the movement needed to be and could be turned into a political powerhouse. And so gathering without regalia, he spoke on the issue of raising money for his own defense and on the desire to become a voting block in North Carolina. In just two weeks, regalia gave way to suits and ties and a visible respectability for people that largely resent, represented the exact same agenda. As for Dr. King, a lot needs to be said, and that's why we have plenty of time left. This is the person that introduced Dr. King when he spoke at Reynolds Coliseum. His, man, his name is Dr. James Cheek. At this time in 1966, he was president of Shaw University. He would eventually go on to be president of Howard University in Washington, DC, and become so distinguished that in the 1980s, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by the President of the United States. This photo was taken from 1968, that week-long time in Raleigh, where places like Green Brothers Warehouse was burned down, Weaver Brothers Auto was burned down, and the Shamrock Apartments were burned down in Raleigh. 
when a curfew was set on NC State's campus and when violence was very much uh, happening. No representative from NC State University welcomed Dr. King to its campus on July 31st, 1966. Moreover, the document, documentation became extremely difficult. It became extremely difficult for a couple of reasons. One is because of where we look and who we look to find. These three women on your screen are equally important in talking about the civil rights movement in North Carolina. On the top left is a woman named Helen Gay, who served Dr. King's meal when he came to Rocky Mount in 1962. On the bottom is Dorothy Cotton, a woman that would be closer to Dr. King than any other woman for the last six years of his life. She's from Goldsboro and attended Shaw University. And the top right is the wonderful woman I mentioned earlier, Millie Dunn Vesey, who hosted Dr. King when he came to town in 1966. She had organized the local NAACP and she had also staged bus rides to the March on Washington as early as 1963. But let's talk about the lack of doc documentation on Dr. King. This is a photograph that appeared in the Carolinian. It shows approximately seven microphones and recording wires heading down. So a logical thinker would say, surely there has to be some part of Dr. King's speech available. But here's how the press worked in 1966. They came with their recording equipment, wrote their stories, then taped over those things the next day. They did those things habitually over and over again and consistently. And so I can literally name all seven newspapers whose recording equipment you can see in this photograph. They listened to the speech, wrote their story, and then taped over Dr. King's speech. As for what actually happened on that day, we have another photograph where great people like James Davis Patterson and Hurley Evans are seen wearing the pins I talked about. You can barely see how oversized they are, but guess what? Nobody at the Carrier Linian ever kept the negatives from the photographs they took. So all we have are these old mimeographed versions. And this sole photograph is the only one we've ever been able to locate because the News and Observer purchased it from AP. It was taken by Perry Acock. I have placed multiple phone calls to relatives. I have searched high and low at the UPI and the AP for the rest of the roll of photographs he took and none has yet surfaced after over a year and a half now of looking. Now a little education. This camera you see is a camera for broadcasting live images. Dr. King's speech was broadcast live over WUNC television, but it was not recorded. And I've called all the appropriate radio stations. Dr. King's video that might have been taken was lost, not because he was Dr. King, but because those were standard practices at news agencies to get rid of those reels or cover over them. And so we have no recording. What we can do is piece together speeches that Dr. King took. Also, a number of those seven local newspapers um, out in various regions recorded a lot of Dr. King's comments. One of the things he said noteworthy was this. He said, freedom has grown a bud, but has yet to flower. He also told the audience at Reynolds Coliseum 5,000 strong that these are his words, not mine. The white man needs the Negro to save him from his guilt. The Negro needs the white man to save us from our fears. Dr. King was incredibly profound when he spoke on this particular date. The last thing I wanna mention before we turn to questions is this. I put together a timeline of where Dr. King likely would have been on July 31st if he was not in Raleigh. And it was one of the final things we discovered in putting this story together. If Dr. King were not speaking in Raleigh, he would have been in Gage Park, Illinois, in a Chicago suburb, in one of the most violent rot rallies and marches that his group ever took place in. You're looking at photographs of July 31st in Chicago, in which 30 cars were set on fire and 60 people were seriously injured. Dr. King would have been among those marchers on that day. In fact, saying over and over again that the most violent crowds he ever saw were not in Mississippi or Alabama, but were in Chicago. This is a picture of Dr. King after he was hit by a rock 
four days after his appearance in Raleigh. This is him in Marquette Park, Illinois, outside of Chicago. The men with their hands on their head are not trying to hurt Dr. King. They're trying to protect him. He has already been struck by a stone. He is staggering and they are trying to protect him and cover him from further injury. Dr. King's visit to Raleigh saved him um, substantial injury. It was injury he eventually would sustain, but at least on this occasion that you're looking at, Dr. King was prepared for it because of what had already happened days earlier. The very final things that I wanna to mention to you are how many people have been involved in this project. The African American Cultural Center hosted the in-person museum exhibit a year ago. And so John Robinson Miller was really responsible for pulling that off and pulling it together and making it so impressive. The actual layout of selecting photographs and creating the experience, which is also here recreated digitally now by the libraries, is the sole responsibility of the great contributions of Kelsey DeFriends. We also have Marion Fregoli, who really realized that this history should not be lost and, and took this initiative to have this collaboration between the libraries and this project. That also involved people like Chris Tonelli having the vision for what it would look like. The slide you're looking at and the 14 others that are variable, available in the iPro Immersion Theater were created by uh, Brad, excuse me, uh, Brett Bradford. I'm so thankful for him. And we've even been able to document people that attended either the speech or the rally, rally on audio and through interviews. And so Virginia Ferris has created and started an archive where none existed. Again, there was zero material evidence of Dr. King's visit because it took place in the summer, because uh, Dr. King wasn't particularly popular at NC State at that time. And so we have now started an archive documenting these materials and making them available. This is uh, an important moment for us to think about this particular time and reflect on what happened. We have often thought about what happens to these kind of energies, but I think we have a lot of evidence surrounding us in our daily lives of where these energies resurface and how they resurface in these particular ways. Um, thank you for this chance to give you this overview. I look forward to continuing our conversation now through some discussion and questions. Um, July 31st is when KKK and Dr. King met in Raleigh. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, now we'd like to open up the floor for questions. Just pop, just go ahead and pop them in the chat and um, we'll, we'll bring them up to Dr. Miller. Um, Noah Weaver. Noah Weaver just want, wants to say that it's very impressive how everyone was able to unearth this history with the lack of material culture. I don't see my chat box. Do we raise our hand or how do we? Um, if you want to uh, just write your question in the chat, we'll go ahead and ask Dr. Miller. Um, your chat box should be, there's an icon at the bottom of your bottom of your Zoom screen. That's like a little dialogue bubble. Um, so Natalie has a question. Were NC State students notified by anyone on campus that MLK was coming to Raleigh? So three interesting things, Allison. Um, first of all, we have to remember it was summer. And so students weren't really around and summer school wasn't very, very visible at that particular time. The second thing is uh, known to a lot of folks that have been around the Raleigh area for a long time. In the mid 60s, Reynolds Coliseum was almost treated like a public space. A lot of people came and used the venue. That's the reason a number of governors have been had their inaugural balls right here is because it was kind of seen as a state location. Um, dating back to 1949, in the early 50s, it was the largest building in the state. Some would argue one of the most important buildings the state has ever constructed. And so there was kind of this strange sense of 
on NC State's campus, but often open in this particular way. So students wouldn't have really been notified about it because they really weren't present. That's also why we don't have like the school newspaper, right? The technician documenting this, other things, even professors around. But I think the third thing is the most interesting is that I find over and over again, students that attend our school right now have no idea Dr. King King. So it's one thing, right? That in the moment and the time in the summer, we overlook it. But when you have a Nobel Prize winner come to campus, um, it's forgotten. And that's largely for two reasons. We might think of it as kind of a double disinheritance. It's very embarrassing to talk about Dr. King's visit because you can't get away from the Klan rally. And so if you're a local North Carolinian, this is at the very least a stain on your feelings about our area. If you happen to not be um, the default folks, and, and if you have kind of this history of witnessing the KKK and understanding it, it's incredibly painful to even bring it up. A number of folks who attended Dr. King's speech, especially if they were black, can't get out of their heads what the KKK did on that day. And so there's kind of this double silence that surrounded it. Um, another question. At the time of Dr. King's speech, what was the status of integration in the schools in North Carolina? Yeah, even though it had certainly been legalized, as everyone knows, in 1954, it was very slow in happening here. And so you will find often uh, dates like 1969 cropping up where schools are actually being integrated. I'll speak with specifics. Booker T. Washington High School in Rocky Mount is slowly being turned down and integrated. Uh, and the stats behind these things are absolutely unbelievable. In that community, the black teachers um, had higher credentials than anybody at the white school in town. A vast majority of them had earned their master's degrees over the summer. Uh, black schools like the ones in Wilmington as well were absolute strongholds of educational standpoint, had incredible teaching staffs. And these integration models often turn in this particular way. So uh, you will find uh, more harrowing accounts. And I am so thankful to a man that attended Dr. King's speech. His name is Ira Harris. We've been able to record a little bit of his memories and we're continuing uh, following up with him in these particular regards. And he will talk about um, knowing people that were some of the first students that were brought into certain white schools to test out segregation, but under the real privy of trying to make sure that it didn't happen and showing that students couldn't be successful. And so rousing up violence and the horrors of some of the things that these folks went through is far worse than anything you saw in these photographs. And so uh, integration was very uh, non-existent for many, many rural areas in 1966. How does this speech match up with the Woolworth sit-in? It's so interesting to compare. I'm so thankful for that question because it is startling to think of North Carolina's role in the civil rights movement. I mean, a, just a short list of events. You get February 1st in Greensboro, the sit-in movement. Uh, you get uh, that 14-day window afterwards where nobody knows what to call it. And so in Dr. King's private letters, he says, I'm very much interested in the sit-down movement. I think we need to have more sit downs because nobody has gone back to the 1930s and drummed up the labor history of sit in movements. Um, you get Dr. King um, stepping uh, back, even though he comes here in April of 1960 to encourage the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to organize right at Shaw University. You have Dr. King's first ever I Have a Dream speech um, in Rocky Mount, nine months before the March on Washington. Um, this event is very, very different because the sit-in movement energized students and youth and really brought together a movement that was more bottom up than top down. I think one of the things you might note is kind of these energies moving in separate ways. There's been a lot of questions over the years of why did the KKK have such a foothold in North Carolina? Was it because the tensions were so high? Because there was a clear resistance movement? Because there was a gathering of folks opposed to it? Uh, was it an economics analysis in terms of what had been lost and gained and what was still at stake um, between kind of the rural and the city economic boon in this particular way? But in terms of historical value, the sit-in movement and the things that began in Woolworth 
really resonated across the country in a new direction. Um, this became a mode of time where instead of there being kind of this either or, we have this huge contingency of folks really opposed to Dr. King. I didn't even get a chance to list all the slides. When Dr. King came here in 1966, the mayor did not greet him with the key to the city. Remember, he'd already won the Nobel Prize uh, at this particular time. He was greeted by kind of a second tier person. Uh, we mentioned the introduction earlier. Uh, Dr. King would leave here with the memory of Raleigh and its Klan marches. Months later, he would say to people privately, for one of being one of the most liberal states in the country, I cannot believe that North Carolina can have such large Klan rallies. He was impacted by what happened this day. And his statement was this. He said, we have to do it this way to bring hate out into the open so that the community has to deal with it. And his logic was that if it just stayed buried, if it was just voters, then it couldn't be seen. But when it showed itself, right, when it unconcealed itself, then it kind of bared witness to its own truth. And of course, truth is a secret that gets repeated. And a rally like that uh, was not soon forgotten. All right. Um, so what evidence did you find when you traced the steps of the march? Um, yeah, yeah. Terrific, <laughs> terrific question. So the first thing, I, this is how it always works when you're a researcher. I know we've got a lot of incredible scholars and, and professors out there, uh, former and present. I started with a thought. I thought that the marchers wanted to go through what is known as Black Raleigh. On the other side of the Capitol are still businesses, but they were at their very height in the 50s and early 60s of the Black Business District in Raleigh. Um, there are great warehouses. There are a number of stores down there, a furniture store. There's still a barber shop on that side of Hargett Street. So my supposition was that the Klan wanted to walk right through that business district and try to intimidate those communities. Um, they didn't do that. Partially, probably because it was a Sunday, but also, I think, because that monument meant so much to their heritage and what they believed they were defending when they held up those Confederate flags. And, and so, um, but the one thing that came out was the very pragmatic issue of gathering in the south part of town. There was just open fields at that time. You could park. You didn't have to worry about paying for parking. Going past that monument was quite startling because I had not anticipated that when I put together the streets and I said, oh, it's almost a ritual for them um, to go past that monument and believe in what they're kind of activating in terms of that history. And it reminded me at the time that monuments, of course, are never just what they're supposed to be. Uh, they're never what, you know, the originating speeches are about them. They are also what the rhetoric is that builds up around them. And the visual rhetoric of walking past there and down that is, is quite startling to me. So that was the biggest startling factor. And then I put together and realized that the photographers would not have gone up there. They just made the simple block walk over to Salisbury um, to get their images. So walking that area though is still startling. Thinking about 1800 people strong, how long that would have taken for them to go down Fayetteville Street. Are the churches that advertised on the pages you displayed still in existence? And did anyone in your research group reach out to them? So I get more questions from churches than anybody else. And the majority of questions I get are seated like this. We're wondering as we're doing a lot of racial justice work and recounting for our own history, if we were one of the churches that was involved in that advertisement. I found a really interesting summary from another person that helps me kind of contextualize it in something other than the terms of, you did speak out in an advertisement against Dr. King or you didn't, right? That false dichotomy. There's one local church who said that they took a vote, would they, give financial resources to Dr. King in visiting here. And a person on that council said that it passed by one vote. And his take was that even though they didn't take out an ad in the newspaper and speak out against Dr. King or have a sermon against him, calling him a communist or an anti-Christ, um, nonetheless, 
uh, that thin veneer, right, between being on one side of history on the other was far, far thinner than, than one or the other. Um, I am well aware of which churches on that list are still in existence. And, and I think that's kind of work for them to think about and, and work through in this particular regard. The challenge I had was naming names. And I decided to name names because the folks named their own names in the newspaper. And so I never had a qualm that this was somehow, you know, digging something up. It's a public record and it was a public advertisement. And so I think that work is ongoing. The way to think about working through this, I think, is with a great deal of humility on everyone's part and realizing the context of things and getting a sense of what would happen. And you know, it's fascinating. This iteration of the Klan will die off in less than two years. Accounts of tax evasion, misuse of monies will bring this iteration of the Klan down. And these folks will have membership cards being ripped up in their faces and burned under crosses when it's revealed that people like Bob Jones were taking many of the funds to buy themselves Cadillacs. And so this iteration of the Klan dies down. And of course, its remnants creep up in any number of really potent ways. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of work um, on every front um, for all of us to kind of work through. We've been contacted by a number of folks and we've loaned as much information as we can. And we're, we're really proud of the work that a lot of folks are doing out there. All right. Um... Have you interviewed individuals who were there at the march and the rally to see how their perspectives have remained the same or changed? Yes, and um, I've contacted and been in touch with about five people that were at either the rally or the march. The most startling one was the first person. Um, I did an event a number of years ago, three years ago probably, and I was talking about Dr. King's visit to Rocky Mount. And a Raleigh woman came up and grabbed me by the elbow and she wanted to pull me aside and talk to me. And she said, do you know what happened when Dr. King came here in Raleigh in 1966? And I said, go on. And she said, well, I was about nine years old at the time. My father grabbed myself and my sister out of bed. And he said to me words that I'll never forget. She said, come with me. I want you to see what hate looks like. She had a father who wanted to make sure that his children knew the forces that were out there and were willing to walk down the street in public. The folks that wanted to go see Dr. King speak, what they can recall about the Klan is often through sobs and tears that leave them shaking and trembling. And, you know, David Soselski is probably our state's finest local historian, and he is 100% right when he says that a lot of these Klan rallies started out almost like picnics. There'd be food and barbecue and music, and you'd simply show up to listen to them. But he's also right in saying that they often ended in the most violent possible ways. When we talk about this iteration of the Klan, in 1965, the United Clans of America in North Carolina invited the three men who were known to have killed a black civil rights walker who was walking from Selma to Montgomery. And when those three men were acquitted and let off, the Klan invited them as heroes. So often those gatherings ended with idolized representations and praise for people who had gone beyond the rule of law to sustain white supremacy. All right, we have one more question and then I think it'll be time to wrap it up. Um, what parallels or impacts, if any, do you see between these protests against Dr. King and the Black Lives Matter protests and counter protests this past summer? It's uh, very startling to think about what happens when you indoctrinate the next generation of folks who attend a rally like this, whether they're in hoods or whether there are youth made to be aware of what's out there and possible. You know, if you were a black citizen in North Carolina in 1966, 
Very often you knew the signs of a clan gathering that were indiscreet. A corn stalk out of place on the side of the road meant there was going to be a gathering that night without any signage in this particular way. So the intimidation to one side, the indoctrination of another side, those energies don't die out. They continue to kind of fuel and intermingle and intercount with one another back and forth in any number of ways. And so you can imagine this built up frustration coming out in calls for repeated justice. Uh, nobody out there saw that image of the policeman shaking hands with the Klan leader and didn't think of how diverse this strategy is and how difficult it is to maneuver. And you also get a sense of people who believe this idea of their own superiority, are blind to their own bias, believe that they also should be acting on that. And so these twin realities, these fantasies, these divisions, they really continue to kind of spell things for us. And of course, none of us out there believe history started in the 1960s. We'd only need to go back, oh, I don't know, to 1871 and find out that our governor, William Holden, was impeached because he tried to root out Klan members in Alamance County. When the North Carolina governor pointed fingers at Klansmen, the local government found a way to impeach him and then release those Klansmen. And so this is a history that is far longer than the centuries we can name far longer than the 1960s, and of course, really informed people out there, which I always enjoy listening to more than speaking to, um, can tell it better than I where it might be going ahead of us in the future. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Miller. Um, Andrea is going to wrap us up. Thank you all for joining us today and taking part in such an important conversation. Educating ourselves is key to breaking the cycle and working to become a more inclusive and equitable society. I also want to take a moment to thank our guests who are members of the NC State Alumni Association. Dues paying members help to fund the programming we offer, just like today's event. Additionally, we hope that you'll fill out the survey that we are dropping in the chat now so we can get a feel for what you guys are interested in learning about in future virtual programming events. And now I'm going to pass it over to our friends of the library folks. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, we hope you enjoyed Dr. Miller's presentation as much as I did. I, it was fascinating. Um, we have two more programs coming up in this campus history series. The registration links are available for them. So please feel free to sign up. And we hope to see you at the next program. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you.